psalmist reminded us, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. I hope that resonates with your soul this morning. Welcome to worship here at Kernersville Moravian Church. We are glad that you are here. Whether you are here physically in our sanctuary or joining us virtually via the internet, we are glad that you are here. I hope that you are planning to continue with our time together uh, with our fellowship meal following worship this morning in our fellowship hall. Uh, there is just something about sharing a meal together that just makes it special, doesn't it? If you see all the things that are going on in our church this week in the back of our worship guide, I hope that you will take a look, even if those events don't pertain to you. Um, all those events are ways in which we minister to our community through the gift of our space. That's a, a great gift that we share with our community. Please remember that next Saturday is our shredding event. Uh, for $5 a bag or a box, you can get rid of all those papers that are clogging up your house, your desk, things that you want to safely get rid of. You can just bring them to church next Saturday between 10 and 1. Uh, it will not only help you clean your house, it's a little fall cleaning, but it will also help our youth. Um, look at the calendar. It says um, October 23rd, which means it's only about three months till Christmas. I was in one of the stores this past week, and the decorations, the Halloween and the Christmas are fighting it out. But Christmas is coming, so here what that means is we have lofties coming up, which means it is time for us to replenish our uh, candles for our candlelight love feast. Uh, tomorrow and Tuesday, we're going to be having some sessions to do just that, uh, meeting over in the activities building from 10 to 12. You're invited to come and help make some candles. We don't need tons of candles. Uh, COVID reduced some. We have some in reserve. But we do need some, and we need your help to make them. Uh, invite you to do that. You do not have to be an experienced candle maker. Uh, training is available. It's another way in which we can share the light, literally, of our community, of our church, with our community. Um, quick announcement. Our Bethany Cafe is coming up, and uh, we need a, just a few things. Tomorrow morning, uh, Eddie is going to be hanging the banner. And if you are available to help him do that, if you were to see him following worship, um, that would be a great assistance. Again, this is not rocket science. Um, I'm told that even I can do that, but I've got another appointment out of town tomorrow morning. Uh, but if you will see Eddie, that would be a great way that you can help. And if you are a member of the serving team, if you've signed up to be a part of our serving team, um, for Bethany Cafe, there will be a short meeting immediately uh, following the service in the back of the sanctuary. So it's one of those where if you didn't sign up, you may be captured right in the back <laughs> before you leave. Uh, but if you will, if that pertains to you, invite you to, to help out. It has been a week, hasn't it? I mean, our state is still reeling from the gun violence that racked our state capital this week. There are wars and rumors of wars that blanket the, our news. And even in our own lives, we carry events with us. So welcome to Sanctuary. Not only this physical place, but this spiritual place, a place where we can lay our burdens down and rest in the loving arms of our God. Welcome to worship. Let us worship together.
Will you join me in our litany? I lift my eyes up to the mountains. From where does my help come? My help comes from the Lord, who made heaven and earth. We look not to the mountains or valleys, even to heaven or earth, for God is found among us. Wherever two or three are gathered in Christ's name, God is here among us. Come, let us worship the God of creation, the God of people, the God of community. Let us follow Jesus, for Jesus is the way. Let us worship together in faith. You are able and sing together hymn number 481. seated. <clears throat> our Old Testament lesson this morning comes from the prophet Jeremiah. Will you hear these words of our Lord? The days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will sow the house of Israel and the house of Judah with the seeds of human and the seeds of animals. For just as I have watched over them to pluck up and break down, to overthrow, destroy, and bring evil, so I will watch over them to build and to plant, says the Lord. In those days they shall no longer say, The parents have eaten sour grapes, and the children's teeth are set on edge. But all shall die for their own sin. The teeth of everyone who eats sour grapes shall be set on edge. The days are surely coming, says the Lord. But I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. It will not be like the covenant that I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, a covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, says the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. No longer shall they teach one another or say to each other, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, says the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity and remember their sin no more. This is the word of our Lord. Thanks be to God. 
God has made a covenant with us, we should live up to it as well. And part of that means that we share the bounty of our lives together. I want to say thank you to you for last Sunday. Sometimes we just talk about the future, but last Sunday, our youth took part in the crop walk, and you generously gave over $2,000. $2,000 that will go to help feed those in our community who lack the very necessities that we so often take for, take for granted. They will be out after, so if you missed your opportunity last week, there's another chance this morning. But this is also our opportunity to share our gifts with our church, with our God. May we be generous as our God is generous with us. Let us pray. God, you have given us so much. And we come to now to share some of that. They are representatives of the love we have for you. And we pray that they will be used to share your love with our community and our world. Receive these gifts, O oh God, that we offer to you. In your name we pray. Amen. Our gospel lesson this morning comes from the 18th chapter of Luke. May we hear these words of our Lord. Then Jesus told them, told them a parable about their need to pray always and not to lose heart. He said, in a certain city there was a judge who neither feared God nor had respect for people. In that city there was also a widow who kept coming to him saying, Grant me justice against my opponent. For a while, the judge refused. But later he said to himself, Though I have no fear of God and no respect for anyone, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will grant her justice, 
so that she may not wear me out by continually coming. And the Lord said, listen to what the unjust judge says. And will not God grant justice to his chosen ones who cry out to him night and day? Will he delay long in helping them? I tell you, he will quickly grant justice to them. And yet, when he comes, will the Son of Man find faith on earth? This is the word of our Lord. Thanks be to God. Sunday school class was busy at work. There all the children working furiously, hoping that maybe the picture that they were coloring might make that place of great honor, the refrigerator door at home. One child was coloring the picture of Noah and the ark with all the animals making their way in. Another child was capturing the, the story of Jesus blessing all the little children Still another little boy was showing the walls of Jericho come tumbling down. All of them were being done in an age-appropriate, impressionistic style. And the teacher was going around praising each child, commenting about how wonderful it was, giving them his praise. But when he came to one young girl, however, he wasn't quite sure what he was seeing. Not wanting to be critical, to thwart her art, her talent, he asked wisely, can you tell me about your picture? She looked it up at him and responded as if it was obvious to anyone who had eyes to see. It's a picture of God. 
a picture of God, he said. Well, you know, no one knows what God looks like. They will when I finish, she said. <laughs> that teacher and that little girl were both right. No one knows what God looks like. We don't have a cave painting from the days of Adam and Eve when they took evening strolls with God in the garden. We don't have a rendering from Moses of God hard at work chiseling the Ten Commandments in the stone. We don't even have a sketch of God's backside as he passed by. We don't have a JPEG on our phone, an 8x10 glossy on our living room. We don't have one of those James Webb photos, you know, the ones we've been seeing recently, where if someone would just tell us what we're seeing, we would be in awe. Well, it would be wonderful if we did. We had a picture of God. No one knows. No one knows what God looks like. The teacher was right. But that little girl was right, too. No one knows what God looks like. Yet we all have that image that we hold in our minds and in our hearts, don't we? What does your God look like? For many of us, I would guess that God looks a lot like that Michelangelo picture, the one that you've seen from the Sistine Chapel, whether you've actually been there or not, that one of God stretched out across the spheres, fingertip reaching out, to touch the fingertip of Adam. For many of us, God looks like that. An old white man with a long flowing beard. There are variations, of course, from the classic beauty of Michelangelo to the comedic satire of Monty Python's Flying Circus, where God is always an old man with that essential beard sitting on a cloud with a lightning bolt and some witty word, words always spoken in a deep, resounding voice. Different, but they look an awful lot alike. And, and when God isn't the old white man sitting on the cloud, we pay attention, don't we? And this past week, as I was doing some reading and some research on this sermon, I got sucked down a rabbit hole in one article someone had mentioned the movie Dogma. Did you see it? It's an older movie. If you haven't seen it, you're out of luck because you can't rent it. It's tied up with one of those Harvey Weinstein lawsuits. You can't rent it. But in this world, in this world, you can see it on YouTube. I recommend you do such. Not to give too much of the story away, but Ben Affleck and Matt Damon play these two angels who have been kicked out of heaven but are, have found a loophole and they're going to get back into heaven even though it will completely undo all of creation. And there's this other group of ragtag people who are sent to stop them. But what caught my attention as I watched it and laughed all over again is that in the movie, God is played by Alanis Morissette. And she never speaks. She just changes the image we have. When we see her, our attention is grabbed, if for no other reason than that sits, since God doesn't look like that. Sometimes we have those experiences that jar our very being. I remember taking a youth group on a mission trip to Jenkins Jones, West Virginia. We were working way back up in this holler, repairing some homes, leading the vacation Bible school in a local church, which happened to be an African-American church. Yes, I was as surprised as, as anyone that there was an African-American church in the deep hollers of West Virginia. But what I recall was the reaction to our youth when we went into the sanctuary for the very first time. And there, behind the baptistry, was one of those murals, a painting of Jesus. He was doing all those Jesus-y kind of things you do, 
loving children, feeding individuals, performing miracles. It was just that Jesus was black. For some upper-class white kids, it was rather jarring. And we had, a long, had to have a long conversation about theology and art and God. What do you do when you are confronted with a picture of God that doesn't conform to your mold? See, right off the bat, we have to admit that we do have a picture of God. All of us do. Sometimes it's a caricature. Sometimes it's a reaction to life, to someone or something to blame. Sometimes it's just a partial image that we take for a whole. We all have a picture of God, for better or worse. And that picture shapes our faith, our theology. It shapes our lives. And at times, we need to be open to allowing that picture to change a bit. For years, I had heard about... <coughs> read about, read books by Fred Craddock. Fred Craddock was a professor of preaching at Emory University, <clears throat> and his influence on preachers in this country cannot be overestimated. He was a giant among preachers. <clears throat> so imagine my surprise when I finally got to see him and hear him in person. This giant of a preacher was only about this tall. He made jokes about his height. And this voice of a generation, when he spoke, it made me sound like James Earl Jones. <laughs> a squeaky little voice, as he put it. Oh, but what he did with that voice. But my picture of Fred Craddock changed. There are times when we need, when we are even forced to revise our picture of God, even if our picture is one that we have drawn from Scripture. The text we heard from Luke this morning is one that has multiple names. It's sometimes called the parable of the unjust judge or the parable of the persistent widow. Both <coughs> of those titles are limited, but they do influence our view of God. Growing up, I was taught as the text says, that this story teaches us how we are supposed to pray, to be persistent, to keep praying, to pray and pray and pray. Don't give up. But underneath it, though, as we read the story, is one that makes me wonder. Luke says, as a way of teaching his disciples about prayer, about faith, Jesus tells them a story about a widow. He probably wasn't a real person. But the disciples knew women just like this in their community. They knew her from synagogue school. They had heard the story about the widow who had helped Elijah, about Ruth. While they were stories of women who had done well, though, the vast majority of widows in that world were left relying on the goodness of strangers. They had no rights. They had no property. They had no insurance. There was no social security other than the goodness of their children, especially their firstborn son. Widows in that world could be cut off, driven away. The Hebrew word, word for widow resembles the word for be mute, keep quiet. That says all we need to know. It's all we need to know about this woman. Keep quiet. Women were to keep quiet, to be invisible. But here, in this story, we have this woman. She is anything but quiet and invisible. From the story, it seems that she has been cut off from the family. After years of marriage, she is left alone, left without any resources. And she just wants what's due her. She wants justice. And so she goes to see the judge. He will grant her justice. That's her unshakable faith. Only this judge, this judge is not just. He's not Judge Wapner or Judge Judy. He is as crooked as they come. 
But it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. He's been on the bench so long. He's not up for re-election next month. He doesn't care. He has a lifetime appointment. He's not afraid of voters. He's not afraid of God. He's going to do what he wants to do, what's best for him. But this woman, this woman is becoming a nuisance outside his house every morning, shouting at him, screaming as he goes out to get his newspaper. She follows him down the street, embarrassing herself, calling attention to her plight, screaming at him. She won't go away. No matter what he does, she won't go away. And after a few weeks, maybe a month of this, he just becomes, gets a little concerned. She's not going away. I have ignored her, but she won't go away. She's become, it's becoming embarrassing. At some point, at some point, she's going to give me a black eye, either figuratively or who knows with this crazy woman, she could do it physically. I'm going to give her what she wants. I'm going to tell her son to share his inheritance. I'm going to make sure she has a place to live. I will give her justice. It's not going to cost me anything. It will just let me sleep at night. That's how we've heard the parable, isn't it? We are that woman. We need to be that woman who comes and asks for help. We need to pray and pray and pray and pray. We need to pray and pray and badger God who is the... Whoa. The unjust judge? God is the unjust judge? Really? Is that the God we have faith in? Is God really like that? Is that the picture we have of God? Earlier, in his gospel, Luke tells another story. And that one tells the story of a friend who comes knocking on the door late, late at night, asking for three loaves of bread so he can feed a friend who has suddenly come in from Asheville. The man's already in bed. And really, he doesn't want to get up. It's 10.30 after all. It's late for me now. But this guy keeps knocking and knocking and knocking, calling out, can I have three loaves of bread? He's waking the children up. And so Luke says because he is a friend, because he wants to get his kids back to sleep, because he wants to go back to sleep, he gets up and gives the guy three loaves of bread. And then Jesus asks another question. If your daughter comes to you asking for a hot dog, would you give her a snake? If your son comes asking for a bagel for breakfast, would you hand him a rock? Of course not. That's not how we act. That's not how we act. And Jesus says, and you're not God. Love is not the essence of who you are, as is the essence of who God is. So for us to read this story from Luke 18, to read this story of the unjust judge and see ourselves as the widow and God as the unjust judge, may I recommend and suggest that that's a total misreading of this text. It gives us a very wrong picture of God. See, God is not looking to deprive us of good things. God is never seeking to make our lives harder, more difficult. God never, ever, ever sends bad things our way. They come. They come, but they are not sent by God. Rather, as my dear friend and former theology professor Frank Tupper used to remind us, in all of life, in all of life, God is always doing all God can do to bring about redemption, to bring good things to our lives. God is always doing all that God can do to bring good things into our lives. God never sends bad things. 
you wouldn't do that to a friend, would you? To one of your children? So what makes us think that God, who is the very essence of love, would do that to us? If you have somewhere along the line been given that picture of God, may I suggest that maybe it's time to change that picture. Even if it's a picture that you got from, a, from the Bible, from a well-meaning Sunday school teacher, if the picture you have of God is one that at times makes life harder, that sends bad things your way, Maybe it's time to change your picture. It won't be easy. It won't be easy. Many years ago, Anita found this wonderful picture stand. It'll hold about 16 pictures. And over the years, we have filled them. I mean, it's pretty much filled with pictures of our girls, our daughters, and most of the pictures, I will say, are pictures when they were young, infants even. Those pictures when they were going off to preschool, those first day of school pictures when they're in elementary school. You, you have them too, don't you? And I love those pictures. But recently, as we were getting ready for one of our moves, we had the conversation about whether or not we should replace some of those pictures to put in some more up-to-date pictures. Anita raised the question. My initial response was, why? <laughs> no, I, I like that picture. I took that picture. I remember Allison holding that little bag going off to preschool. I remember when we went to the balloon festival. I love those pictures. I love the little girls in those pictures. But I also love the young women they have become, the mothers they are. You see, to replace that picture does not mean those old ones were wrong just capture who they are now. And isn't that the faith we want? One that is current, up to date, not captured in the distant, distant past, but one that helps us have a thriving, growing relationship with God. What is your picture of God? Does it need some updating? Might we have the courage to be real with God and with ourselves? Amen. I invite us to stand if we are able to sing our hymn, 541.
And let us pray together. God, even that word brings an image to our minds. For some of us, it's an image so firmly ingrained in us that we would know you if we saw you in the grocery store. For others, it's a bit blurry. It's been so long since we've spent time with you, communed with you. There are times we wonder if you would recognize us. And for some of us, oh God, we pray that you wouldn't. Our lives have fallen so short of what you intended, of what we desire. We slink into church here with guilt and shame and really do hope that we won't see you, even though we so want to see you. Still others, God, when we see your name or hear your name, we see so many different images that it's hard to distinguish. We just don't know. And yet we still call your name. We call your name out of our need, our need. We pray that you might reveal yourself to us again, that you might give us direction. We pray that you might give us you. For God, our souls are restless until we find our rest in you. God, we come to you, worship you this day. And as we do, we bring our picture of you. But we also bring a whole portfolio of pictures from people in our lives, people we know, people that we need to bring to you. We see their names in our worship guide, but even more, they are private. Individuals who are known only to a few, their needs, just a handful, but are known to you. And so, God, we lift them up to you even now. God, we carry a picture of you in our souls. But even more, God, we pray that you will carry our picture. We pray that from time to time, as you look out over our world, one of your angels might come to you and point us out and say, look, God, they look a lot like you. God, we pray that you will give us the faith, and the courage, and the love to conform our lives to you, as did your Son, in whose name we offer our prayers. Amen. To conclude worship, I invite you to stand if you're able and sing hymn number 735, O Master, Let Me Walk With You.
thank you again for being a part of worship this day. It is good to see you. I hope that you will stick around and join us for our fellowship luncheon in uh, the fellowship hall following. There are times, there are times in which you do a sermon and then a few weeks later it really hits you in the face. A few weeks ago, wrote a sermon that I didn't get to give. I came down with COVID and Eddie, to his great credit, delivered the words that I had written. It was a sermon about Davies and Lazarus and about whether or not we actually see the poor in our area. Friday afternoon, I joined with many of our congregation to do interviews for our Christmas stocking. Can I express to you what it meant to me to sit there and talk to these individuals, to hear their stories, the whole time thinking, how do you live? How, how do you make ends meet? Anita and I have talked about it often, I'm sure you have too, about how much more expensive things are now. Inflation, in fact, you go to the grocery store and it costs you $7,000. You take out a loan to buy your groceries. And we are fortunate enough, though, that we don't have to sit there and say, no, I'm not going to get this. I'm not going to get that. I will just I say, tell that story to say thank you. Thank you for that endeavor which this congregation has been leading for years. Uh, we had over 100 families to come uh, in the last couple days. And we're going to seek to do our best to provide Christmas for their families. Um, that is a meaningful act of worship. Something that we can do for God, for others. So thank you for that. Um, thank you for the ways in which we're going to serve a meal this coming weekend for Bethany Cafe. For the ways in which we continue to do Things. You've been doing them for years. And so you just sort of think, yeah, it's just what we do. For someone who has come from afar, or as the Broadway play says, come from away, <laughs> it's not little things. It's not a little thing that you are doing for our community, for our world. So thank you for that. I hope you will take some sanctified pride in it. Don't get so proud that we have achieved everything, but you're doing good stuff. You're doing good stuff. And at some point, a new pastor is going to come, and he or she is going to have a foundation on which to build that you have done, not only these past months and years, but for generations. So thank you. Thank you. I hope you feel good about it. I do. It's with that that we go from this place to live out our faith, to do things for God. So as we go, will you hear our benediction? You are the people of God. So go. And as you go, may the Lord take your hands and work through them. May the Lord take your lips and speak through them. May the Lord take your hearts and set them on fire, both now and forevermore. Amen.